On June 26, 1861, Juan A. Quintero, special agent for the Confederate States of America, sat in the palace in Monterrey, Nuevo León, Mexico, listening to Governor Santiago Vidori relate a familiar but nevertheless surprising story. He had long been searching for some method whereby he could effectively resist the federal government, Vidari began, and now he hoped that he had found it. Initially, Vidari had thought that a republic of Sierra Madre might be the solution, and many observers on both sides of the Rio Grande felt that this was the course he would pursue, but that had been discarded. The new confederacy presented a different alternative, one that he believed might be feasible. Would Southern President Jefferson Davis agree to annex the northern Mexican state of Nuevo León and Coahuila? Thus began a relationship that endured for over three years and did not end until the powerful Caudillo fell from power. Having given the matter careful consideration, Vidari cited many advantages to Quintero of the agreement for the South, as well as Nuevo León and Coahuila. The two areas, Texas and northern Mexico, had been trading profitably since the first successful Anglo-American colonization in the Southwest. In addition, northern Mexico offered tremendous potential in mineral wealth and agricultural productivity which could be exploited with adequate technical skill and industriousness available in the South. God had made everything beautiful in Mexico except man, said Bedori. That is from an article from July 1969 in the journal The Americas by R. Curtis Tyler entitled Santiago Vidori and the Confederacy. I'm Joshua Trevino, and this is The Hard Country. everyone, and welcome to the Hard Country Podcast. My name is Melissa Ford. I'm a policy director at the Texas Public Policy Foundation, and I'm joined by Joshua Trevino, the foundation's chief of intelligence and research. So, Josh, thank you for sharing that passage. There's a lot I want to unpack in there. Yeah. But first of all, I wanted to ask you about your relation to Santiago Vidauri. And I just thought that that would be very interesting for the listeners to learn about. <laughs> okay. Well, not not an unprompted question, uh, of course. But, uh, you know, it's it's interesting when you look at the, the settlement patterns and the history of that portion of northern Mexico, particularly what's now Tamaulipas, mm-hmm. which used to be Nuevo Santander and then Nuevo León. And it's the same families over and over and over. And so you see this repetition of names, Falcón, Garza, Vidori, Borrego, Sanchez, and so on. And uh, Vidari is not uh, an unknown name in my own family tree. And so I went and looked, and Santiago Vidari's great-grandfather, Juan Antonio Vidari, who was the first Vidari to colonize Nuevo Santander as part of the Escandon colonization. I think he was born in 1728, if I remember correctly. Uh, That was Santiago Vidari's great-grandfather. He's also my 11th great-grandfather. So Santiago Vidari is some kind of a cousin off on a different branch. Um, but the Vidaris are still around. And interestingly enough, in South Texas on the north bank of the Rio Grande, uh, I believe in Star County, could be in Zapata County, I've forgotten which of the two, but it's in one of the, the very rural border counties in Texas. Mm-hmm. There's still a blockhouse in existence that was the Vidari blockhouse. Uh, and when they, uh, when the original Vidaris, Juan Antonio and his family went and colonized the north bank of the Rio Grande, again, this is under Spanish bourbon rule at the time, um, they built this blockhouse and, uh, and, and and basically lived in it. Uh, so you had to overnight the blockhouse because there were uh, Tonkawa and Comanche raiders that would uh, just make it incredibly unsafe at night. And uh, what I've read uh, is that uh, the blockhouse was the residence. Um, and, and, and keep in mind, when we talk about a blockhouse, we're talking about you know two to three foot thick right. kind of adobe walls, yeah. and there's there's gun slits uh, in them. So it's not really windows, but it's enough to um, you know fire a rifle out of. And uh, they had to live there for about half a century. Uh, it was that long before it became safe to actually have like a ranch house that you could reside in permanently, right. which really just to me illuminates just the chronic danger and the perennial perilousness of this part of the frontier. Yeah. And it's a theme that was current in the 18th century. And in some ways, it's like that today. Right, right. And I wanted to ask you about that. First of all, I think it's so cool that you can trace back your family line for that long. I think that's amazing. Uh, But one thing, there's a lot of interesting things in this passage. Um, They talk about annexation, which I think is interesting. Mm -hmm. I don't think that's where you were trying to go with that. But one of the themes that we're talking about that we're seeing today is how how Mexico is, right? So there's been this theme for a very long time of Mexico's, uh, I guess, 
northern Mexico's like quasi independence, uh, right. this kind of ungovernability, which is actually what we talked about, I think, episode one or episode two of the hard country. Sure. Uh, when we were quoting Mike Pompeo's book, how he talks about all these ungoverned spaces at the border, yes, uh, which can become kind of like a safe haven or a breeding ground for a lot of nefarious or terrorist activity. And so I'm just interested in knowing what you think about these ungoverned spaces at the border, like what can be done about it? Yeah, well, uh, a big question and one that's come into sharp focus this week with a lot of the news coming out of Mexico. Yes. Uh, and so we'll talk about that briefly. Yeah. Uh, look, Mexico as a polity is not is not itself particularly young. Uh, if you date it from the Spanish conquest, it's half a millennium. If you date it from kind of like the dawn of, of like uh, Nahua Aztec history, it's it's uh, it's more like 700 years. So so, so there's a considerable stretch of antiquity that comes into Mexico. But in terms of modern political arrangements, uh, the form of the Mexican state, which I would argue is currently transforming for the worse, really has only been around since uh, effectively the 1990s. Um, uh, but this theme throughout Mexican history has been sort of this push-pull of, you know, to what extent does, and, and, and let's be very candid about what we're talking about, to what extent does the Valley of Mexico, kind of writ large in its adjacent areas, classic Mexico, the Mexico that uh, Cortez and Montezuma would have understood as the land of the Mexica. Um, to what extent does it rule the rest? And and historically, you know, pre pre Spain, uh, it didn't. Uh, you know, it didn't rule the Yucatan. It didn't rule um, uh, kind of the the lands like like the Chichimeca, and it didn't land, rule uh, the north. And so all of this is sort of like this the, the, this add on that comes through this accreting process throughout history. And when you look at how the Spanish uh, actually administered um, uh, all of these all of these possessions, uh, it was it was divided up into various intendancies and kingdoms um, that were at least in theory kind of co-equal to they were never co-equal to the viceroy in Mexico City, but they were sort of co-equal to like the core uh, Mexico. Right. So when independence comes uh, in kind of this, this 1810, 1820 period, not just for Mexico, but for all of Spanish America, for most of Spanish America, pardon me, yeah. um, uh, you know, what, what, you don't, what you don't see is uh, Mexico necessarily splintering along those internal lines. So like Nuevo Galicia never becomes independent, uh, Nuevo Leon quasi uh, mm -hmm. such, but Mexico sort of coheres. There's a brief moment where um, uh, where it sort of encompasses Central America, but then that comes to an end uh, fairly rapidly. Um, uh, but that, that that tension between the center and the peripheries uh, continues, uh, and, and it goes on for a long time. And so and so you see it in a lot of different forms. Uh, you see it, uh, for example, in the Yucatan. They have what's called the the, the caste war of the Yucatan, which is this uh, horrific. Uh, almost 70 year long war uh, in the Yucatan that's sort of this grinding war of effectively, um, I'm oversimplifying, but the Mayans uh, versus this kind of overlaying elite that wants to incorporate the Yucatan into the Mexican state. By the way, fun historical note, uh, the Texas Navy's greatest victory off Campeche in 1843 came as a result of Texan naval support for the Yucateco rebels. Uh, and so so I, I believe it's the only incident in, in uh, naval history in which um, some viewer will correct me on one of the points of this, on which uh, sail-powered ships defeat steam-powered ships. Uh, and it's made all the more delicious because uh, many of the Mexican crews were seconded out from the Royal Navy. Uh, so so a great a great moment in Texas naval history. But returning to, to Nuevo León uh, and, and Coahuila in this case, uh, which interestingly excludes uh, Tamaulipas, I believe, in this era, um, uh, it too was an independent uh, center of power, and so there's uh, there's again been this kind of push pull. And what we saw in Santiago Vidori's uh, era, which which is uh, broadly speaking kind of 1850s through uh, late 1860s, he ends up getting executed by Benito Juarez. Uh, by the way, um, uh, he throws his lot in with the imperialists under Maximilian, and so when they're eventually rolled up in the 1865-1867 period, um, uh, he's captured, not given a trial, basically put up against the wall. Tell me again what that uh, that special verb in Spanish is for I being- I think it's acribillar. Acribillar. Firing squad, right? Okay, so 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 uh, they um, acribillar on uh, uh, this poor man, uh, but uh, you know, it's probably- It's a tough way to go. It's, it's, it's a tough way to go, um, uh, but not an uncommon one, which is why we have a verb for it. Uh, and so and so he gets, that, that that's his end. That's the end of Santiago Vidari. So fast forward to today, and what we've been seeing, what we've talked about in several of the previous episodes right. is this idea that a lot of the cartel activity that we see can be understood in the context of this, this sort of chronic um, uh, 
uh, drive toward quasi-independence, toward quasi-sovereignty, toward localism and rule. And you can't necessarily disentangle all this from that. Uh, and I think I think it's it's reappearing in a different form, in a malign form. Uh, but the important thing for us as Americans to understand is that as we look at it, uh, I don't think there's any circumstance under which we sympathize with cartels. But uh, I think we can empathize, not sympathize, but empathize mm -hmm. with, with the drive for localist control, for the understanding that, uh, the, that you should rule yourselves. And uh, a lot of that is kind of buried under what's happening in Mexico now. Yeah, no, absolutely. And thank you. I, I always love learning a little bit more about Mexican history. And I think it's so interesting that the government in Mexico City has always had such a hard time governing, governing northern Mexico, as you say. Um, but one other thing that I want to jump into in this passage before we move on to some other breaking news sure. is um, there's this quote that really stands out to me. And it's a quote from Santiago Vidari. And he says, God had made everything beautiful in Mexico except man. Yeah. Yikes. <laughs> it tells you something, isn't it? This is harsh. And so, I mean, what do you think he meant by this? And, and do you think that a lot of this sentiment is still around? In Mexico? Well, I, I can only speculate. You know, I don't, uh, I can't read his mind uh, post facto. But, you know, one thing that you see uh, in in Mexico, and it's a recurring theme, is sort of this, this contempt of the elites for everybody else. And, um, uh, you know, I've, I've seen it firsthand. Uh, you know, I, and, and this is not by any means unique to me. Uh, I think if you, anybody who goes to Mexico and spends sufficient time there, um, uh, will encounter this phenomenon. Um, uh, you know, I've been in, in uh, sounds like a Tom Friedman anecdote for which I apologize, but you know, I've been in taxi cabs where the cab driver has sort of expressed his contempt for the indigenous who were mounting mm -hmm. a protest and, you know, just this contemptible, these contemptible Indians, basically, the, the indigenous. Um, uh, uh, and, and you also see it in um, uh, kind of, and, and it's openly expressed. Uh, I don't remember if we've mentioned this in a previous podcast, but if you kind of the kind of the go to example that I give people when I talk about the class stratum in Mexican society is what happened with the actress Yalitza, Yalitza Aparicio, who uh, was luminous in Cuaron's Roma, which we've oh. talked about before. Oh, yeah. Yes. So, so she plays uh, the maid, the household help in Roma. And she's, she's, she's one of the two central characters of the film. Um, uh, a fantastic actress, you know, a well-deserved, you know, kind of awards um, uh, circuit that she did when that movie came out, I believe, in 2018. But, uh, uh, you know, there were there were these Mexican celebrities, movie stars, who, unlike her, were, you know, they, they were Mexicans like me. Mm -hmm. They were white, blancos, and, right. and um, uh, you know, much more traditional what you kind of see in a lot of Mexican media. And uh, I'll have to apologize to my Spanish listeners, but uh, this won't offend the English language listeners at all. But uh, th there were several people who had no problem going on the record calling her, you know, pinche india, um, which is uh, which is profoundly insulting. We won't translate it here. But, uh, uh, you know, and it, it, eventually there was kind of this coerced apology from these figures and things like that. But that was the mask slipping. Uh, Tenoch Huerta, uh, who, you know, Marvel fans will know is Namor. Um, but who has done much better work elsewhere uh, uh, has a has a video series on YouTube that actually talks about this. You know, he also is is a heavily a uh, person of heavily indigenous ancestry mm -hmm. um, uh, who's very dark skinned and talks about kind of the reality of being in Mexico. So let's let's rewind this back to Santiago Vidari. Um, uh, you know, he's, he was an elite and uh, he had very if you see a photograph of him, it, to me, it's not so obvious. He actually looks like kind of this weathered sort of brown um, uh, you know, like like if you told me he was this uh, Norteño peasant, uh, I would have believed you. But but we know like he has explicitly Spanish ancestry and so on, and, and regarded himself as a caudillo of the Northeast. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so he he has this he had this this attitude toward his own citizenry, um, uh, in which uh, yes, Mexico is beautiful. It's 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 a pity about the Mexicans, um, uh, but you know you can't you can't build a republic. On that attitude, uh, you can build an autocracy on it. Um, you can build a dictatorship on it, which I think you know men like Santiago Vidari pains me to say, since he's a relative. You know, we're probably trying to do. Um, uh, but uh, this is this is kind of to 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 put it in to give it a modern cast. Yeah. This this is a lot of Amlo's appeal, right? You know, you know Amlo. We've talked about the Mexican president. You know, Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador. 
and uh, and just what a uh, everything wrong with him, which I think we're going to talk about a lot. We will in a minute. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, but part of the reason that uh, he remains enduringly popular, uh, and again, I empathize with this quite a bit, uh, and and you know we have an obligation to understand it, is that um, uh, Amlo is consciously against those who hold contempt for ordinary Mexicans which uh, in the Mexican context has too often been almost anyone who describes themselves as, uh, you know, conservador or elite or rich. Uh, I'll close with this, a personal anecdote. Um, uh, A few years back, I don't remember, it was uh, was two years back or three years back, uh, I was in Polanco. You've been to Polanco? Yes, I love it. uh, You love it. Uh, I'm not as in love with it, uh, (laughs) honestly, but but, but Polanco, well, well, tell us us what Polanco is for for the listeners who don't know. It's like the nice neighborhood, right? You have all the new na- new coffee shops, all the new restaurants, all the trendy stuff. Um, there's a big park. Everybody takes their dogs. It's just like it doesn't really feel like that cartoon version of Mexico that a lot of people picture. It's just like the nice city, nice neighborhood area. But it's more than the nice neighborhood. Right. Condesa's nice. Roma Norte's yeah, nice. Right. You know, Coyoacan's nice. Like there's other nice neighborhoods. Santa Fe's nice. Polanco is the rich neighborhood. Yes. Polanco is where the wealth and capital accumulate, and it is a different way of life from the rest. Uh, and it's just, do you know why Polanco is it's where like it is? Bubble. I just learned, I just learned no. this actually last year. The reason that the, the wealthy neighborhood is there is because Polanco um, rests on uh, effectively this, this chunk of granite that has floated to the surface so the earthquakes don't hit it. Oh no! So Mexico City, one of the most earthquake-prone cities in the world, yeah. and uh, and and the reason Polanco is there, and you can build the high-rise luxury apartments That's and things like that. Fascinating. Right, it's the, it's the one part of the city that doesn't fall down. Yeah. Um, anyway, so so the rich go there. Well, uh, anyway, so it's, I'm, I'm glad you like Polanco. Um, uh, you're young and vital, and and uh, uh, but uh, I'm I, I I don't care for it as much. I don't mind it, but uh, I much prefer sort of the. Um, uh, uh, anyway, a little, a little bit more rougher edge part of the city. All of which is to say, though, I'm in Polanco, and I'm having coffee with some very nice folks. And uh, this gentleman brings um, uh, a a, uh, a a companion with him, and so it's a young man who's not really part of this conversation, but uh, but but he's there, and he's he's obviously he's obviously one of the wealthy young people of of Polanco. Great clothes, uh, okay. outstanding hair. Nothing I'm jealous. <laughs> uh, but uh, but 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 he's sitting there, and 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 finally at the end, this is our only exchange. He uh, he he asked me in very heavily accented English, you know, which is better than my Spanish. He says, uh, "What other parts of Mexico City have you seen?" And and I told him the truth. I said, "I said I have to be honest with you. You know, I'm I'm not as familiar with the city as I want to be. You know, I I know the area around the Basilica de la Virgen de Guadalupe. I know you know I obviously know Roma Norte and El Centro and and uh, Condesa and a little bit of Polanco." And I said, but you know, I'd like to get to know it more. And so I asked him, what else should I see? Where else should I go in Mexico City? And he said, this is almost verbatim, uh, don't bother, the rest is trash. The rest is trash. And that is the attitude that Santiago Vidari has and that cripples, in many ways, Mexican civil society across time. Um, the rest is not trash. The rest is the stuff of your country. Right. And uh, you know, I have no more time it's just a personal view for anybody who has contempt for their countrymen in any country than I would for, say, in the United States, uh, the Acela Corridor elites who have contempt for people in Appalachia or the South or the Midwest or Kentucky or wherever. Um, mm. That's not real patriotism to me. No, I, I completely agree. And it's it's unfortunate, but it's not just Mexico that has that. And I think that you've really put this quote in a very different light. Um, by showing not only that Vidari was Mexican when he said this, but that this is still like a really real sentiment in Mexico. And it's not just Mexico. I think I was telling you this is something that I've heard before um, in my own country, in in Bolivia Bolivia growing up. Um, And it was kind of, I guess, phrased a little bit differently. The first time that I heard this was kind of, it was an anecdote. And I learned about it in my BSS class. I don't I, I don't forget this. It was a teacher, and she kind of said it as a joke. Uh, BSS is what we call Bolivian Social Studies. I was, I was going to ask learned, that. Okay. Like history, geography. Um, did you go to a, Did you go to an English language school? Or yes. Were you in? Okay. But we learned in Spanish and in English. I we see. had some okay. courses in English, like math. Understood. But we had social studies, and it was Bolivia themed, right? Mm-hmm. And so it was all in Spanish. And she told this kind of joke, I guess, a cruel anecdote of God creating Bolivia. 
And as he was creating it, he kind of was extremely generous, gave it everything. I mean, beautiful, for fertile land, mineral wealth, just tremendous oh, riches um, yeah. in, in so many ways, like a very, it was, it's very productive agriculturally, all of it. And so he was making it, he was making it so great. And the angels or whoever would be with God at the time uh, were, were asking him, like, why are you doing this? You're giving it too much. Like, it's not fair. Um, why are you doing this? And God says, like, he kind of laughs and he's like, just wait until you see the people that I put in there. <laughs> and I always remembered this story. And it's it's sad. It's really sad that um, that this is a story that goes around. Uh, but if you think about it, Bolivia hasn't been, I guess, the best stewards of, of a lot of the gifts uh, that we've been given. Right. And I just thought that this anecdote was very interesting because now I live in the U.S. Um, I'm also an American. Yeah. And this is never an anecdote that would be told here. This is never a sentiment that uh, Americans, at least most Americans, would ever express. Right. So why do you think that Americans don't really have that feeling? I know there's still some contempt, like we were talking about. But why do you think that's different? Well, I, we just we have a different civil society, honestly, and uh, uh, you know, and and there's there's you know, historical reasons for that. There's circumstantial reasons for that. Um, uh, it it uh, it it ultimately, you know, American American kind of like like intra United States like social contempt tends to be uh, it's 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 kind of class on class, it's region on region. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, as a as 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 a southerner, you know, I can tell you firsthand that 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 it's a real thing. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, I can I, I know several people who uh, have wanted to just to give one example, enter academia or enter into media, yeah. and uh, and consciously divested themselves of their native accents uh, in order to do so because all that is class marker. So it's not like we're we're innocent of class and we're this perfect you know Tocquevillian Republican society. Um, but I, I would say we've come a long way better than a lot of where Mexico has been. And, and, and until, um, until that changes, you know, until there is uh, people other than, than AMLO uh, and the populist left are able to tap into that, uh, you know, and, and really express a genuine and sincere and accepted respect for the mass of the citizenry, um, this is just going to continue uh, ad infinitum. Yeah. So not something we can solve. Um, but... I, I will say this. Uh, one thing that the United States can do is provide an example. One of the very heartening um, heartening and also tragic episodes of the past decade in Mexico has been the rise of the Alta Defenses. Uh, so these are self-defense organizations that typically arise to fight uh, cartels. And, and unfortunately, um, uh, most of them end up following a, uh, kind of this dreary trajectory. They're either uh, co-opted into one of the cartels, mm. um, uh, or the army comes and, and crushes them because the army is also in, uh, often in the service of cartels. Cahoots. But uh, a lot of the initial uh, kind of inspiration for the auto defenses, and I want to say this is uh, particularly in Michoacan, because um, there was some reporting, I think, in the New York Times that was done on this several years back, uh, came from Mexicans who returned from the United States. So they were in the U.S. You know, legally or illegally, it doesn't matter, and they were either they either chose to return uh, or they were deported. They came back, and uh, there were some some men who went on the record on this, uh, and and they said, you know, in the United States, we realized that there's a society where we as individual citizens are trusted to advocate for ourselves, speak freely, and own guns, and the own gun part mm -hmm. kind of like set off a light bulb, like, oh, we can exercise rights too, and uh, and, and and so to me, that is that is sort of this this um, it's it, it's passive, but nevertheless, extremely positive role that the United States can play. Uh, uh, because we know, you know, from, you know, we're here in Texas, yeah. uh, Texas, you know, depending on how you count it, uh, plurality or maybe even, you know, soon majority, you know, Hispanic, all that's a huge category. Um, uh, there's no issue with, with, uh, with Mexican Americans, you know, exercising, you know, full civic rights and responsibilities, which is the other half of it that doesn't always get mentioned in a place like Texas. Well, uh, you know, it is, it is a positive sign that Mexicans in Mexico are seeing that and drawing the appropriate conclusions about their own dignity and prerogatives. Right, so, right. who's to say? And I love that that's where you went with it. And you told you said you talked a little bit about the auto defensas and that kind of thing. And mm -hmm. I think that helps us ease into the next thing that I want to talk about. Just because one of the great things from living in the U.S. right is that at least for me, I've always felt so safe here. 
Yeah. And we don't have to deal with a lot of the things that other countries have to deal with. Just one of the many like cartel violence. You don't really normally have to worry about like shootouts or kidnappings or like murders for hire on the regular. Sure. Um, and that is something that in other countries, Mexico, Bolivia, it's not necessarily the same. Right. 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 And it's funny. I was talking to Alice about it last week and she talked about how there was like a Mexican influencer that was making a joke out of like how terrible the police can be down there. And he was uh, calling. He called the police to report an emergency and then he called an order of pizza. He was like, which one do you think we'll get here first? It was always a pizza. Really? Yeah. Just because like, uh, oh, wow. Police is so slow in Bolivia. It's the same. But one thing here in the United States, you can always feel so safe. Yeah. Uh, and I think that a lot of the time Americans are like made fun of when they go to other countries because sometimes they're not in safe neighborhoods. They just kind of feel that safe in other places. Right. And I want to use that to ease into what happened. It was on Friday, the Ma Matamoros. Oh, sure. Yeah. Um, there were four Americans from South Carolina. It was right. like this tight knit group of friends that crossed the border into Matamoros. And a lot has been misreported, I guess, in the media. Yeah. Uh, but what happened is they crossed the border. They had their uh, South Carolina license plates. They were in their little minivan. And almost immediately, it seems like they were being shot at by cartel gunmen. Yeah. And then they were taken out of the car. They were loaded into a different pickup and they were taken away. Sure. And eventually they were found in kind of a, a wood shack. They had been moved around a little bit and two of them were dead. Yeah. And one of the two that were still alive was injured. Yeah. And so uh, I, I want to first ask you this question. Sure. Is this something that happens a lot? Because <laughs> <laughs> it makes big news, right? Every time it happens. It does. Like Americans in Mexico, uh, we see it. Um, yeah. But can you shed a little light on whether this is actually more common than we think? I have to. I have to begin with this particular story by acknowledging an error on my part uh, with this. I believed, uh, which I should know better than to do so at this point, uh, but I believe the initial press reporting on this, mm. which was that it was an American family of four. Uh, and so when I initially read it, American family of four, uh, you know, my mind went to it was probably a Mexican-American family going yeah. to the Matamoros to visit family, which actually happens fairly often. Yeah. It's, it's typically anybody, Americans driving across the border um, in private vehicles are usually, I mean, you can kind of assume that they're, that they're probably Mexican-Americans with either dual nationality or they have family in Mexico, very common in South Texas. Uh, well, I was wrong, um, but I wasn't wrong uh, in time. So the border report that the foundation sends out uh, 48 hours ago went out with a letter from me saying that it was a family of four. So for any of you watching who get the border report, sorry about that. <laughs> it wasn't a family of four. It was four Americans yeah. uh, coming from South Carolina, as you right. said, in a van with North Carolina plates. So it turns out, though, that it was uh, three men. Uh, so all, all four of the party are African-American, apparently from South Carolina. Mm -hmm. Um, there's some public record of uh, some involvement with with drugs. Yeah. Some of them in the past uh, here in the United States, and uh, and and so the story was that uh, the woman, so it was one woman, three men. Uh, the woman wanted to get a tummy tuck in Matamoros, and so she drove from the Carolinas to Matamoros, Mexico, oh, to get a tummy tuck uh, with three male companions. All of which is technically possible, um, but uh, the more that I learned, the more that it struck me uh, as, as very implausible. Uh, so this morning, there's reporting out of Mexican media that, um, uh, well, the, the upshot is that it looks like they may have been involved uh, in drugs themselves, which is a great way to get caught in a shootout with cartels in Matamoros. Uh, Matamoros is actually a place that I personally wouldn't go, and I'd go to a lot of places in Mexico. So, uh, you know, we don't know. We don't know the full story. But uh, as with everything that happens uh, in Mexico, particularly with regard to cartel violence, we have to, uh, you know, we have to take it with a grain of salt and right. kind of kind of re recognize that there's multiple narrators at work, uh, many of whom are unreliable. And in this case, uh, you know, mea culpa, I got taken in by the initial unreliable narrator. A lot of us did. Now, now, now that being said, well, it's kind of you to say, uh, uh, but th that being said, th this incident has queued up um, this explosion in Mexico-related policy activities. Right. Why don't you 
tell me where you want to go with that because I yes. don't even know where to start on this one. No, no, and I yeah. and I do I do want to go into that, but re- but before I ask you that, sure. um, it's still Americans being killed in Mexico. Sure. And so I want to ask you, I feel like we've seen this trend of this happening. It happened in 2019 to an actual family, it did. right? In yes. Sonora. Yes. It was this family, I think they were dual nationals. They were Correct. going to a wedding. The LeBaron Listen. family. Yeah, yeah, nine of them were killed, I think. It was like three moms and their young children. It was all mothers and children. Yeah, yeah. one of their S- SUVs like exploded after uh, gunfire. It was just absolutely nuts. Terrific, and yeah. uh, what I want to ask you before we dive into the current events, I know we have a lot to talk about, is I feel like the fear that used to be there of attacking Americans uh is kind of gone. Yeah. There used to be like more respect in that sense, right? Yeah. Like cartels would not even want to bother with Americans. It was just not worth it. Right. Because they knew that justice at one point would be swift and right. it just wasn't worth it. And I feel like we're not seeing that anymore. We're not seeing the same kind of fear that we used to see. Yeah. And I want to get your thoughts on that before we jump into the rest. I, I mean, I wholeheartedly uh, agree with that. And it's a huge problem. Um, uh, you know, you had, the, you had the murder in the, the mid-1980s was it 1986? Kiki Camarena is, is murdered, yeah. the DEA agent. But, yeah. um, uh, it, 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 correct me, some listener, correct me if I get the year wrong on that. I believe it was 86. The mid-80s, Kiki Camarena is murdered um, uh, by kind of the precursor to the modern Sinaloan um, syndicate. And, uh, uh, and, and, and there's a lot of U.S. activity, uh, uh, you know, kind of retributive activity toward that end. In fact, we just uh, recaptured Rafa Cabra Quindaro in the past few months, um, who is on the radar and kind of was at the top of our list specifically because of that murder that happened, you know, coming on to 40 years ago now. Um, uh, so, so you're right. Uh, for a long time, there was sort of this deterrent effect. Not that it was safe for Americans to go to Mexico and no one would touch them because that's not the case. Because there's plenty of Americans who would be in the wrong place at the wrong time and, you know, fall kind of unintentional victim to, to either local crime or cartel activity, or they would, you know, very stupidly get themselves involved in, in drug activity themselves uh, and get themselves killed, which, um, uh, you know, is, is a choice that they make. Um, uh, but at the same time, there was never there was never a targeting of Americans. Uh, and, and I think you're absolutely right. That seems to be going away. Um, uh, you know, what happened in, in Sonora in 2019 um, with the with the, the the massacre of the LeBaron women and children, and, and we have to you know we have to emphasize just how horrific it was. It was oh. a pla- it was a planned ambush. It was deliberately it was deliberate targeting yeah. of this American family. They killed the moms, and then uh, uh, they set the they set the vehicles on fire to burn the children uh, alive inside. Uh, you know, I, I, I related this several times. Might have even done it on a previous podcast, but it's just it is it it really drives home just the monstrousness and the bestiality of, of these cartels. Uh, and the fact that nothing happened from the United States after that, uh, I think really sent a signal um, to a lot of the bad guys that the, that the walls are falling. We had a conversation in 2019 with, um, uh, with, with, with a, uh, an individual, I'll just say an, an individual in American law enforcement is uh, one identify him here on air. Um, we sat at a cafe with him and talked to him, and he was, you know, very gracious to us and uh, kind of gave us his views. And and the last question that we asked him is, "What's protecting you? Like you live in Mexico, you're here, you have loved ones here. Um, uh, you know, what's protecting you?" And his answer was nothing. He said nothing. They're not afraid of us anymore. They don't feel like there's anything keeping uh, them from hitting us anymore, and they don't think that we'll do much about it. And I have to say, I think you know his estimate was probably right. Uh, now it isn't right across the whole spectrum of American governance, but that does seem to be the ruling paradigm. And so what we know from history is that that's going to um, result in some bad outcomes given sufficient time. And uh, one of the tasks I would urge upon American governance and policy now is, is uh, you know, there's several things we have to do, but one of the key ones is you have to reestablish that deterrence. Mm-hmm. You really do. There, How there, there's do that? got to be a price. Well, it's, 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 it's simple to say, but it doesn't have an easy answer. Um, but, you know, w- one of the things that we have to, that we have to think about is, you know, we have this large, uh, so this kind of gets into a lot of the conversation of the past 48 hours in the policy community, and you've seen, uh, you know, three senators and two representatives that I know of endorse foreign terror designations for Mexican cartels, endorse authorizations for use of military force in Mexico. This is rocketed to the top of the policy conversation 
Um, not a surprise to us at the foundation, uh, uh, you know, if I can take a, a small victory lap here on air, um, you know, I've got here, I have here with me a memo, which uh, I won't release publicly because it is an internal memo, but I, I, I printed it out. Pardon me, you printed it out and graciously brought it. So thank you very much for doing that. Uh, uh, but this is from uh, December 15th, 2019. And the top lines in the memo um, were that, uh, so this is, you know, coming over three years ago. Uh, I wrote, Mexico, like, here's what you need to know. Mexico will get worse. The Mexican state is collapsing. Mexico's elites are the problem. Uh, a terror designation is a good idea. Mexico's president isn't up to the job, um, but there remain some areas for cooperation. A hundred percent of that remains true. Yeah. And and so what we've seen is a fulfillment of trends that were obvious to everybody but the ones who were actually making U.S.-Mexico policy mm. because of the inertia and the desire to look the other way rather than to confront the trajectory that Mexico was on. And so now to kind of answer your question directly, you know, what do we need to do? Um, uh, we, I, I would say we need to put all options on the table. You know, it, and we have to keep in mind uh, what we've discussed here before, which is that our ultimate policy goal is a Mexico that is strong, sovereign, uh, and polices itself. You know, ideally the United States should have no role in Mexico's internal peace, internal adjudication of its politics, anything like that. But to the extent that we are compelled to have one, uh, because we are, right. by virtue of the choices of Mexican governance itself, which has willingly ceded 30 to 40 percent of its territory to the cartels, which has willingly turned a blind eye to cartel activity, which has willingly become complicit and, and taken Mexico, the Mexican state, to the precipice of narco state status, um, then we have an obligation to defend ourselves. Uh, and so, you know, I think it is fruitful to have these conversations about should we em employ the U.S. military? Should we act unilaterally? Excellent. Should we have a foreign terror designation? Um, you know, we have in the United States this robust and gigantic military apparatus, and uh, it is deployed to particular ends around the world. Um, we see it engaged in supporting Ukraine's war versus Russia, uh, which in full candor I support. We see it engaged in preparing for a defense of Taiwan, which I also support. But if we see it engaged in these things on the other side of the world, but it won't engage in the defense of American communities on American soil in places that you can walk to from the United States, then what good is it? Yeah. You know, you and I both heard an anecdote, uh, and I don't think we have permission to say from whom, but it's an anecdote uh, uh, from a policymaker in the past week uh, about a conversation that unfolded uh, within the past five years over the use of the United States Navy to interdict um, uh, fentanyl and drug supplies. And apparently, uh, I actually didn't know this, uh, I was aware of maritime routes up and down the Caribbean, um, uh, you know, for drug trafficking and things yeah. like that. What I didn't know and what was, was news to me is that there's actually a robust um, Pacific maritime trade as well. And so, these, and so these boats will basically come from Central and South America. They'll travel up the Pacific coast and they'll either offload in Mexico proper for overland transit to the United States. This is all cartel activity. Uh, or in some cases, they'll actually land on a U.S. beach and, and, and offload or go to an American port or things like that. And so, and so this policymaker asked, um, well, well, don't we have a Navy or a Coast Guard uh, to do something about that? And, and, and uh, again, secondhand. Uh, so, but, uh, but apparently the answer came back, uh, no, the Navy's really focused on China right now. Well, well, look, great. The Navy's focused on China. It should be focused on China. China's, you know, probably our premier foreign threat. Of course. But, but uh, again, what is a Navy for? If 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 you're if you're pleading that the Navy is engaged in the Western Pacific, um, uh, you know, for American national strategic ends, uh, but it's unable to police the sea lanes coming into California, uh, you know, our own territory and soil, then there is a serious disconnect. What are we doing in American governance? You know, and this this is sort of like the theme of all American politics since basically the famous elevator ride in summer 2015. Uh, you know, who? is American governance for? On whose behalf is the country ruled? And if we're a country that's ruled on behalf of, of the people of our country, I mean, set aside Mexico's governance problems, we have a crisis of legitimacy all our own. Uh, we've got to start talking about using the elements of federal power to actually defend American communities. And Mexico is, to my mind, the number one place to start having that conversation. Absolutely. And not everyone's tone deaf to it, right? We're starting to see this conversation, which is something that we've we been are. talking about for so long. Yeah. But recently, um, our Congressman Dan Crenshaw, mm -hmm. uh, our U.S. Congressman out of, out of from Texas, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, he has been bringing up 
all of this talk about how we need to stop drug cartels from killing Americans. Well, he and Congressman Waltz have a, a, exactly. an, AUM, an AUMF bill. Yes, yeah, right. so, so there's several pieces of legislation. One of them is the authorization for the use of military force against cartels. Mm-hmm. And the second one is intended to kind of hit them where it hurts, hit their wallet. So this is the Declaring War on the Cartels Act, Sure. Um, which would help uh, seize the cartels' assets. Yeah. Uh, now... I kind of want to talk about the response that the Mexican president had to this. Oh, please. He was absolutely outraged. And I actually I have his quote. So I can read it directly what he said. And you can kind of translate it a little bit and shed a little color for our our listeners. I'll do my best. So um, what AMLO had to say about this is. Esta iniciativa de los republicanos, además de irresponsable, es una ofensa al pueblo de México, una falta de respeto a nuestra independencia, a nuestra independencia, a nuestra soberanía. Y si no cambian su actitud y piensan que van a utilizar a México por sus propósitos propa- propagandísticos, electoreros, politiqueros, <laughs> nosotros vamos a llamar porque no se vote por ese partido. Amazing. Yeah, I mean, it's it's an amazing. It's 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 uh it's such it's such brazen hubris and effrontery. It's yeah. incredible. So 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 to translate that, tell me if I get it wrong. So basically, he's saying that the that the proposals from the Republicans. Note that he only blames the Republicans. But he way. only blames them. And one more thing he says Go ahead. is he calls us por intervencionistas, mm-hmm. inhumanos, hipócritas y corruptos. Lo que dijo ayer ese senador no lo admitimos. A México se le respeta. Okay, so 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 sorry. So we're interventionists, we're we're corrupt, we're inhuman and hypocrites. Uh, and hypocrites. Yes. Hipocritos, of course. Um uh, yeah, so <laughs> So, so for our English speakers in the in in the listeners, basically what the president of Mexico is saying is that the Republicans are behind this drive to insult the people of Mexico to degrade mm-hmm. Mexican sovereignty, and that uh, if they continue talking about this, he will mobilize Mexican Americans in the United States to vote against them. Isn't that a, that's an incredible thing to say? Yeah. Uh, I, I mean, it's it's it's, it's candidly amazing. And, and frankly, if, if there was like similar rhetoric, if any if any U.S. office holder said we're going to motivate people to vote against Morena in Mexico, he would have an aneurysm, right? But yeah. but but he believes so. So several things to unpack here. But one is one is Amlo's just messianic belief in himself that he is the the full representative of the fullness of the Mexican nation, and so Mexican Americans. Um, uh, are somehow spoken for uh, like it. Well, I mean, look, I'm Mexican American, right. and I'm telling you right now, AMLO doesn't speak for me because uh, I'm, you know, because I'm American, right? Yeah. And so, so, but, but, there, but there is this effort. You know, I've been to Laredo and on, you know, in in, in Texas, the Texas side of Laredo, not Nuevo Laredo, but Laredo itself. There's AMLO posters uh, around the plaza down oh, there. Yeah. So, 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 so the, these networks exist. They've always existed. The Plan de San Diego in 1915, which was this very abortive effort to start a race war in South Texas, in which the Mexicans would exterminate all the Anglos, um, uh, was actually cooked up by Carrancistas, who also had political ties back to Mexico. So again, nothing new under the sun, right? Uh, right? But uh, but uh, the, the, this, is, this is the delusion and the hubris that AMLO is bringing to this. Having brought Mexico to this point, uh, where suddenly, uh, you know, almost in an instant, everyone is talking about um, these, uh, frankly, uh, solutions that would have been unthinkable a week ago, you know, right. AUMFs and FTO designations yeah. and so on. Uh, now, um, uh, AMLO is is panicking, and I agree with um, Alejandro Hope, uh, who is a very good Mexican security analyst, that flexible thinking is not AMLO's strong suit, uh, right? And so, and so he is he's reverting directly to this idea that well, I'm the father. This is not what he calls himself, but basically he thinks I'm the father of the Mexican nation. I alone speak for the Mexicans. That's true for the Mexicans in the U.S. And you better watch out because I control a fifth column in the United States that will destroy the Republican Party if you don't stop speaking against me. He really does believe that. Now, it's not actually true, right? Like he doesn't. Like Morena has a has a marginal presence in the United States. It's it's, it's very it's very passing. I, I'm not denying that there are connections, right. but but we know this Mexican American and more broadly Hispanic voters. Um, uh, you know, are extremely heterogeneous, and and, and fr- frankly, there's simply no way that the president of Mexico is going to come, except with very discrete populations. You know, probably in California, um, that he could that he could move election results. So, so, so what he's managed to do is is insult uh, uh, one of the two major political parties in the United States. Yeah. Um. Uh. And and he's also obliquely insulted uh, uh, Mexican Americans, uh, also who simply are not at the Mexican president's beck and call, and uh, the overwhelming majority of whom, and when I say overwhelming, I mean 90% plus, if compelled to choose, 
between the United States and Mexico or 1,000% going to choose the United States. Uh, and so to force that choice is, is, is candidly stupid of him. But even worse, so there's so much to unpeel on this, even yeah. worse is, is you have to marvel at the strategic incompetence of the Mexican regime. Think about the requirements of Mexican grand strategy. There's really only two. Uh, one is to uh, grow economically, uh, and the other is to avoid conflict with the United States. That's it. That's it. That's all you have to do. If, if, if you've managed that in your, in your sex annual, in your six years as Mexican well. president, then, then good work. Like you've done it. You left the city a little stronger, you know, to borrow Reagan's phrase. Um, uh, and AMLO has managed to, to, to screw up both. Actually, so the you know you know whereas you know you rewind to about eleven years ago and Mexico looked like it was tipping into a, a majority middle class society, that's over. Um, uh, you know he's he's de facto reversed the um, uh, the energy sector reforms that passed under Peña Nieto. Probably the only good thing that Peña Nieto did, but he's reversed those. Uh, uh, Mexico now, uh, you were in the conversation that I was in. I, I guess extreme poverty is what thirty percent of, of Mexicans. Um, is it? I don't, I was it extreme know. poverty? I, I don't recall the exact figure. It's some shockingly high figure. It's very high. Uh, almost all of which is concentrated. It might be higher than thirty percent. Maybe, yeah. Who knows? But uh, all, almost all of which is concentrated actually in the Morena electoral base, which is in like southern, heavily indigenous Mexico, which is also terrible. Um, and then he's managed to provoke conflict with the United States uh, with, a, with, with a leadership class that really just wants to be able to ignore Mexico, candidly. Like, like, like there's nobody who has a serious interest, nobody meaningful has a serious interest in, in like focusing on uh, you know, some kind of, of, of showdown with Mexico. Just nobody wants it, like on a bipartisan basis. People, you know, the, like the, the baseline kind of median American officeholder interest yeah. is fruitful trade and uh, you know, fight the cartels. And then if you, if you do that, you check the boxes, then you're done and that's it. And they could have coasted on that basically forever. Yeah. Uh, Mexico has no alliances to tend to. It doesn't have any foreign wars. It doesn't have, so it exists in this, this very, you know, uh, beautiful place kind of in the world system. Right. Um, and they've messed it up. They've messed it up. They have, they, 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 AMLO almost single-handedly has dragged Mexico into um, kind of, you know, what I call the kill zone of both major mm -hmm. political parties. The Republicans and conservatives, of course, are hot because of the cartel activity, which is now right. suddenly becoming a thing. Uh, and, uh, and on the left, it's, it's, it doesn't have the same policy solution set. Uh, but on the left now, especially after the past month, and we've talked about the press coverage, they're convinced yeah. that AMLO is, a, is kind of this authorian, author, uh, pardon me, authoritarian, authoritarian. yes, authoritarian, English is my first language, <laughs> uh, authoritarian uh, dictator in the making. And and so, I mean, what a, what, a, what a malign place to put yourself in. And it is 100% his fault. Yeah, 1,000%. 1,000%, A thousand percent. <laughs> sure. yeah. Um, well, I, you brought up the Alejandro Hope column. Sure. Uh, could you tell our listeners a little bit about that? I know that in it, they, they bring up this idea that the U.S. has to act unilaterally. Mm -hmm. um, can you elaborate a little, a little bit on the column? Yeah, uh, I mean, Hope, Hope uh, to me is, is one, of a, one of a handful of just outstanding kind of public commentators on Mexican security. So, so Alejandro Hope. And uh, I've met him once. Um, uh, hope to hope to talk to him again. But um, you know, just one of the one of the uh, I think the best minds and analysts going on. Uh, hope also uh, has a quality that I really admire um, in that uh, he he covers Mexico and Mexican security and has this extremely clear-eyed view right. of what's going on. Uh, he's also a a very committed Mexican patriot. Uh, and so you know, hope when you read his columns in uh, Universal. Um, uh, so, you know, put things, but they, uh, by the way, for, the, for, for those of you, you know, I'll look into the camera for this, for those of you who uh, are interested in like Mexican comment and Mexican press coverage, Google Translate's pretty good these days. Open up a Chrome browser, get the Google Translate extension, and, and, and start reading these newspapers because you, you can actually get a lot of good news from this. And Hope's columns are, are, are things on, on my must-read list. Um, uh, but, but the thing that I admire about him, he's a Mexican patriot, and so he's not in favor of any of this. Like, he's not excited right. to see the Americans come. One of the things that he has really beat the drum on, especially on his Twitter feed in the past several days, is that the armed forces of Mexico need to understand that they have an external defense mission. So the armed forces of Mexico have been oriented toward internal right. quasi-counterinsurgency since 2006. Um, and under AMLO, they've basically taken over large sections of the it economy. It's so much worse. It, yeah. It's got so much worse. So, so they're essentially like this ineffectual, quasi counterinsurgent, quasi narco trafficking force yeah. that that uh, that is just massively powerful. It's almost like these Chinese so state owned enterprise. Yeah, exactly. Arguably the most powerful institution of Mexican civic life at this point. Arguably. 
um, and hope's been sounding the alarm. Listen to what the Americans are saying. Like, like, like you're the army, you're Savannah. Like, you've got a national defense mission. You need to orient yourself toward it. And um, uh, unfortunately, he won't be listened to. But uh, I, I will tell you, you know, in full candor, if I were a Mexican national, I would be squarely where hope is uh, on this. You know, you know, maybe, maybe we should be sovereign. Maybe we should defend our country. Maybe we should not give excuses to the North Americanos to come and do what they feel needs to be done. And that, that that's kind of the gist of his column. I thought he, he's a very perceptive, he's one of the few, I think, Mexican side analysts who understands American politics very, very well um, and is also clear-eyed uh, about what's happening in Mexico. Yeah, no, so it was a very yeah. interesting column. And that's a great tip, the Google Translate. I was looking at the article and I was like, wow, Josh really can read this so well. I, I know you can read Spanish very well, but Google Translate for people who can't as well. Google Translate is extremely helpful. Uh, yeah. But I want to I wanna ask you something else about that. And that is, sure. um, you know a lot about Texas history. You know a lot about history in general. Some of the things that I didn't really get to learn when I was growing up since I grew up in Bolivia. But I know there's a long history of American intervention in Mexico yeah. and Texan intervention in Mexico. Yeah. And a lot of these problems that we're seeing are kind of uh, chronic problems. Uh, right. They've happened before. They will happen again. And so what tools, what can we learn about this and what tools can we have to kind of fight this chronic problem that we're seeing? Yeah. Yeah. You know, the the, the idea of, of intervention as a theme in Mexico history is one that's well known to every Mexican. Uh, and we've talked about this on, uh, in fact, I think we talked about it in the last episode. There's a museum of yeah. interventions uh, at the Churro Bosco convent uh, in Mexico. And so when you, when you when you look at the powers that have basically invaded Mexico, it's, it's, it's the United States, it's the French, it's the Spanish. Uh, I think the British were briefly involved in a, like a port bombardment at one point. And so, and so, th so there's this chronic Mexican sense. And, and uh, it, especially when the U.S. is involved, there's uh, frequently a loss of territory uh, that comes accompanying it. And so, and so, you know, basically the cyclic sort of Mexican descent into internal disorder um, eventually somehow manages to drag in. Uh, uh, principally U.S., but not only U.S. Uh, uh, intervention in Mexico, and and th that's gone on on a grand scale. Uh, so the last time the United States Army entered Mexico, I believe, was at the um, uh, I believe it was the Third Battle of Boras. Somebody can fact check me on this, which I think was in 1920, okay. maybe 1919. Um, uh, in which the U.S. Army basically provides fire support to Caroncistas. Uh, I think it was one of uh, Villa's last last uh, gasps. Um, uh, but there's that. There's the battle. There's the 1918 Battle of Ambos Nogales, uh, in which uh, the U.S. Army garrison in Nogales, Arizona, uh, overruns the Mexican, uh, you know, partner town of Nogales in 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 Mexico. Uh, interestingly enough, arguably the only First World War land battle in the Western Hemisphere, because apparently they discovered dead German advisors with the Mexican side. Um, uh, yeah, and not well known. Uh, interestingly yeah. enough, but. Uh, but uh, but, but a, a real battle that happened, um, uh, and so even and even preceding that era, uh, you would have Texas Rangers, sometimes the U.S. Army. Everybody knows about the punitive expedition in 1916 that chases Pancho Villa. Less well known is uh, the fact that uh, essentially from the 1840s, really um, through uh, uh, through about 1920. Um, it was relatively common for either state, always Texas. Uh, I, I actually can't think of a single episode of like California, Arizona, or New Mexico law enforcement entering Mexico. Although if anybody does who's listening, uh, tell me about it because I'd be curious to find. Yeah. But, uh, but, but Texas law enforcement, usually the rangers uh, entering Mexico to do any one of a number of things, chase bandits, uh, reclaim stolen horses and cattle. Um, uh, you, know, you know, punish somebody, you know, get a fugitive, something like that. And so, and so it happened, it happened to the extent that um, there wasn't a belief that there was a partner on the Mexican side, which often there wasn't, or there wasn't a belief that there was effective governance on the Mexican side, which also often there wasn't. We've talked about kind of the tumult of the, of like the Norteño frontier, which really contributed yeah. to that. Uh, th that all ends around 1920. Uh, you know, it ends around 1920 with sort of the, the, the gradual closeout of the Mexican Revolution and, uh, and then, you know, something we've discussed before, kind of this century of relative border peace in which Mexico is, and it's peaceful because Mexico is an autocracy, right? And so there's just no need. So, so we sort of lose the policy habit of, uh, of doing this or at least having it as an option on the table. And one thing I've been very clear about uh, in my own work and kind of advocacy on this front is that you know I'm not, I, and, and this is an important distinction to make. I'm not necessarily, and uh, necessarily does a lot of work here. But I'm not necessarily an advocate of sending uh, either you know state forces or 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 even federal forces into Mexico. I think, but but I think it should be on the table. 
Uh, I think it should be on the table to the extent that the Mexican state refuses to exercise its own sovereignty. And again, keep coming back to this like a broken record, but we have to. We have to keep saying this. Our ideal is for Mexico to be strong and sovereign on its own. Of course. But until it chooses to do that, and it is a choice until it chooses to do that, um, we would be uh, ill-serving our own citizenry by discarding tools in the kit. Of course. Yeah. Um, I think that's such a great point. And I love saying that. And a lot of people don't expect us to say that. But we, Mexico's our neighbor. We want to see them do well. We want to see them thrive. It's in our best interest. A hundred percent. And I think that's yeah. a, a, a good place to kind of start wrapping it up. And mm -hmm. I want to wrap it up with some something positive. And sure. that's last week we had our Texas Policy Summit. Yeah. And one of the great things that came out of that was we were able to bring some of our friends from Mexico City here. Alicia Galvan, Humberto Lopez, they were able to come here from Mexico City. Alicia was able to be on one of my panels about the U.S.-Mexico relationship. And she was also able to give like a keynote speech where she, she talks about their fight for freedom. They live in Mexico City. Um, they do not like the current government. And she basically kept talking about how the Mexican people are our friends. Yeah. And the Mexican government might not be, they might not be our partners right now, but the Mexican people are our friends. Yeah. So I want to wrap up on that is, do you want to share anything that stood out to you from her speech or from her panel? Oh, yeah. Well, uh, those of you listening, I strongly encourage you to go to the Texas Public Policy Foundation's YouTube channel, and uh, we'll link it in the uh, description here. Yeah. But uh, watch watch uh, Alicia Galvan's uh, address uh, to the Texas Policy Summit that unfolded last week. It's it's a great speech, yeah. a very brave uh, set of remarks. So good. Uh, look, you, know, you, you can't, you cannot look at the sweep of Mexican history uh, and not be conscious of the bravery and adventure that is encapsulated within it. Um, uh, you know, one of the great, one of the greatest adventure stories ever told is Bernal Diaz's uh, Conquest of New Spain, mm -hmm. uh, which is which is a magnificent work of literature. Um, uh, every every eleven year old boy in the world should read it uh, because it will inspire them to uh, you know at least want to be great men. Um, uh, but you know, you, you you press forward from that and the epic of the settlement of the north. Um, uh, you know, I talked earlier in this podcast about the Vidari blockhouse. Just think of what it took, the fortitude and the intrepidity to live for half a century in a blockhouse under attack uh, almost every night uh, and to, to uh, scrape out a living in that wilderness. It is easily the equal of anything that we find in, you know, what I'll term like Anglo-American history, you know, which I'm also very proud. Uh, and so, and so, you know, I, 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 I choose uh, and, and, and it is, it is a, a, a deliberate choice, but it's a, it's a purposeful choice. I choose to regard what we see in Mexican civic breakdown um, uh, not as continuous with with um, kind of the core of what the Mexican nation is, but as a betrayal of it. Mm. Uh, you know, going back to what we talked about with the elites and everything like that. Um, and what I saw in Alicia's remarks was something that I would consider continuous with the best of Mexico and the Mexicans writ large, yeah. which is a spirit of independence, yeah. uh, a positive sort of ungovernability, you know, one that actually we as Texans understand very well and seek to cultivate. And, uh, you know, am I uh, pessimistic about Mexico in the short term? Uh, yes, uh, without question. Uh, the, the, there's a lot of very dark and fraught things that need to be adjudicated uh, in the near term future. But am I positive about Mexico in the long term? Actually, yeah, uh, I am, because I think the seeds are planted for the flourishing uh, of a nation yet to come. And um, Alice down in Mexico City and Humberto and the organization that they, they run, Patria Unida, which is um, may seem like canoed against the waves uh, at this point, uh, are doing something very important, very special. And as friends of liberty, um, as people who actually do want to see Mexico strong and sovereign, uh, we we look on them with uh, admiration. Absolutely. Thank you, Josh. Thank and you, Melissa. Absolutely. I, I will link the panel and the keynote speech. And to all of our listeners, I do encourage you to go follow Patreonida on your social media. And I think that's it for today. Any closing thoughts? I think we've covered it. Man, uh, we'll have a lot more to talk about next week. Yes, so. we will. Good talking. All right. Thank you, Josh. And thank you to all of our listeners. This is Hard Country. Thank you for listening. 